Hello everyone and welcome to this episode of Talk of the Town. I'm James Milan and today we are visiting with Liz Cohen who is the new executive director, relatively new executive yeah. director mm -hmm. of the Children's Room and very important institution here in Arlington and also for surrounding communities. Um, Liz, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, welcome to the show and also though welcome to your Thanks. new position. Yeah. Um, let's start off just to explain a little bit in, a, in, in the broadest sense mm -hmm. what the Children's Room is all about. Sure. Um, the Children's Room is a place where families can come and grieve. The idea behind the Children's Room is that no family or child should ever grieve alone. So we work with families who have a child between the ages of three and a half and 18, and we offer peer support groups at our house in Arlington. We do work in the community, and then we also do some educational programming around grief and bereavement. And I know, as I already alluded to, mm -hmm. that uh, the Children's Room serves a population that is much wider yes. than the scope yeah. of Arlington. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because uh, before we went on camera, we were noting that mm. every community uh, could use a yeah. resource like the children's room, but that's just not the case. No. So how, how wide a, 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 a geographical range do you draw from? We have about 80 communities that of fam families from 80 different communities that come towards us. Eight zero. Eight 80. zero. Wow. Yeah. So we actually, one of my colleagues just did this really cool map looking at the state and kind of where we, it's almost the entire, if you go from like Worcester to the right mm -hmm. and then down to Plymouth, we serve people from that entire area. So we also have some people that come from Rhode Island, some people that come from New Hampshire. Um, but the grief field, especially looking at children and talking about death loss with children, is a relatively new phenomenon. There's very few centers even across the country. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're excited to be able to serve folks and I'm sure we'll talk about my hopes to, to serve more families. Right, absolutely, we will. But yeah. um, when you say that it is part, it, you know, you, you attribute the lack of more children's rooms, I'll just put mm -hmm. it that way, to yeah. kind of the fact that it's, it's a new field still. It is, Is yeah. there, um, is there do, you, do you see, in addition to having certain ideas and plans for expansion of the children's yeah. room yeah. services, do you see that this is a movement that will be growing um, over the next number of years, either mm -hmm. regionally or nationally? I mean, I hope so. I mean, I, I think unfortunately, um, given our climate right now, that there yeah. were children are experiencing death a lot. Um, and we've always been in this country, we've always been way behind other countries in terms of how we talk about death. It used to be when someone died, they die, there's a funeral, and you never speak of them again. Um, and the children's room really came out of this movement, was started almost by a child. So we're based on the model of a program out in Portland, Oregon called the Dougie Center. Um, and it was started by this young boy named Dougie who reached out to, he had cancer and he was dying. Um, and he was on a unit, a, a cancer unit at his hospital, and he could see as you move down the hallway you're literally moving towards death. So mm -hmm. as he's declining, kids were moving down the hallway. So he reached out to Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who we all know is kind of like the, we mistaken it as the stages of grieving, it's actually the stages of dying. Right. Um, and so he reached out to Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and said, what about kids? I don't have a language. I wanna talk to my friends about the fact that we're dying. Um, and she was so inspired by him, she met with him. Um, and then there was a pediatric nurse that was part of that program who helped start the Dougie Center in Portland. And it really was started out of this idea that like kids want to talk about this. When you don't talk about death, it becomes bigger and scarier. And that carries, what we're seeing is it carries through people their entire life. I had um, this amazing conversation with one of our program volunteers the other day. She, we have 80 volunteers that, and that, that work with us, which are amazing, amazing people. 80 is a magic number. 80 is our magic number, apparently. I got to play the lottery on 80. Um, and this one, uh, her day job is she's a social worker and she was running a group in a nursing home and this woman was 95 and at the end of her life, she was mourning the death of her mother. And this was the first time that she could talk about her mother who died when she was a child. 95. Wow. Um, and that we, it's not like if you don't talk about it and you don't talk about the person that it just magically goes away. Um, so 
I'm not sure if I got to the original question. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> um, but it, it really is around this idea that we need to move to a place where we can talk about death, we can talk about grief, we talk about the person who died. You still have a relationship with the person who died. Um, and part of the role of the children's room is to help families figure out how to incorporate the person who died in a new way into their family. And the children's room is in a beautiful uh, is. building yeah. right on the intersection of Mass Ave up in uh, and, and a mm -hmm. slanting street whose name very much so, is yes. beyond me yeah. um, <laughs> up in Arlington yep. Heights right Appleton. now though but yep. very prominent as people move up and yeah. down um, Mass Ave and I have had the privilege of being inside on mm -hmm. a number of occasions and know that it is also beautiful on the inside yeah. as well but tell us Tell us a little bit about what the, mm -hmm. you know, what kind of space you have created sure. there. So the reason the children's room is named the children's room um, is because similar to what happened in Portland, there was a nurse here who was actually part of a hospice in Waltham. Um, and she heard about the Dougie Center and heard about the work that nurses were doing around talking to the kids about death. She started a program at a hospice in Waltham and it became the children's room for kids who had a parent who was dying. Um, and then we moved uh, to the basement of the Baptist Church across from what's now Whole Foods. And then in 2004, we moved um, to the Victorian House, um, which has a very fascinating history. Um, it was a private home, and then it was a funeral home, kind of fitting. Um, mm -hmm. And then it was a spiritual bookstore. And now it's us. So it, it's really interesting kind of how yeah, that, that has there progressed. Was, right. Yeah. There, who knows what the spirits are exactly. that, you know, that really yeah. occupy. It was kind space. of the, the, right, the right place for us, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what we've been lucky enough to have is incredible people on staff who are expressive therapists who really understand the value of therapeutic space and that each room is intentional. Every single piece of furniture, pillow, chime, books, toys, everything is intentional and purposeful to create a welcoming therapeutic space. Um, when you walk in our front doors, it's a home. We welcome you like it's a home. Um, there's couches, there's always food and tea and art projects for the kids. So um, what we find is that after kind of the initial what is this place thing, every time that kids come to the house, they literally are like running they're in running because in. they just know they're going to see their friends, but also that they're going to have a good time. And I think that's the misnomer too, that it's not a bunch of kids in each room sobbing, um, that it's really, it's really around the connections that kids make to each other. Yeah, I'm really glad that you brought that up because yeah. I want to just probe that a little bit further. Sure. What are the kinds of activities you've, mm -hmm. you've mentioned them, but sure. let, let, let's give us a fuller description sure. of the kinds of activities that do take place there. And especially that somewhat startling, you know, revelation that in fact the kids are going in there enthusiastically Absolutely. because they know they're yeah. going to have a good time for right. however long right. they're there. So um, the work that we do in the house, we run six groups in the house. Um, so if you drive by any night, the house is usually lit up from top to bottom, which I I love. I think it's just really special. Yeah, it's a um, very it's very it's, prominent a real house. warmth. Yeah, and you can see it like exactly it coming really out is. of the windows. It's yeah. it's pretty special. So when the families come in, the parents stay downstairs. Um, and if we have a large group of parents, we'll have a group of parents who are dealing with a spouse or partner loss. Um, and then we'll have a different room for parents who are dealing with a child loss. And then upstairs, the kids are divided by age because. Kids understand death different at different developmental ages. A four-year-old will understand the death of their father in a very different way than when they're 14. Um, so we have a littles room, which is ages three to six. We have another room, which is our middles, which is kind of like seven to nine or 10. We have a tween group for 11 to maybe 13-year-olds, and then we have a teen group. So what's very cool is that the kids go into their, you know, parents know that they're downstairs, the kids run upstairs, they go into their group. We always do a check-in. And one of the things that um, is really important for us is this adoption of language. I think we, you know, we talked a little bit about how we don't like talking about death, um, but we ask all the kids to go around and say their name, the person who died, and sometimes how they died. And for kids, sometimes just that is like all they can handle. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's something they have to build up to. Um, but there's also a lot of power. I've seen a power of, um, we had a family orientation night and every, it happened that every child in the room had lost a father. 
and um, just looking around the room, the kids are like, oh, that's really cool. Like, not cool that everyone's, right. but like, oh my God, there's kids like me mm -hmm. that I can have fun with. So we'll do, sometimes there's a, pro, there's a question, sometimes um, we'll do a high, like a high and a low for the week. Sometimes kids do a check-in and talk about kind of what happened in their week. Sometimes there's a theme. We use a lot of different um, conversation starters. So we have a ball and hopefully we'll have you guys come to the house, but a ball full of questions and we actually throw the ball to mm -hmm. each other. And one of the questions could be describe the funeral mm. and you know, which, you know, in other times would have been a taboo, Sure. but, and, or kids can't talk to their friends at school about the funeral, but this is a place where it's really safe and comfortable to talk, for example, about the funeral. Right. So there'll be time in their room and then the, the, there'll be almost like a free playroom. So we have um, a foosball table and a dress up area and puppets. And, um, and then each night there's an, there's a project, there's an art project. So it could be, um, we've made screaming boxes, which I think everyone should own, um, <laughs> which is like a tissue paper box that they can decorate. And then when they're feeling really upset, they can literally scream into, um, we've made grief monsters, which is what does grief look like? What do you want to do with grief? Um, so kids will make a, a, a picture of, or, or create a, an object that looks like or what they think a grief creature looks like. Um, sometimes it's even a drawing before and after, now and then. Mm -hmm. So what their family looked like then and kind of what was the key pieces of their life then and what's happening now. So you know, one example, a child drew a picture, his dad loved to barbecue. And they would have the whole family over, cousins, aunts and uncles, and his dad would barbecue. And so one half was his family barbecuing cousins. And then the other half was now that his father has died, they're not barbecuing anymore. And for him, that was a really acute loss in his life. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a way, we find expressive arts are a really safe way to sometimes put out there what words aren't enough to, to put out there. Um, so we have those kind of projects. We also have a room called the high energy room, <laughs> which is kind of what you think it is. It's a literally a padded room. Um, so there's uh, pads on the, uh, all over the walls. There's a huge bean bag. Um, there's a punching bag, a real punching bag. We have boxing gloves. We have noodles. There's a dragon. You can slay the dragon and um, kind of interpret it however you want to. Um, so for some kids, they get angry and that's safe and normal and expected. They can go in the room and hit the walls. They can punch the punching bag. They can slay the dragon. Um, so there's a lot of constant activity. And then at the end, the families go come together so that parents and kids will all come together. Um, we celebrate birthdays of both people in the room. We can celebrate death anniversaries if that's what something that people want to do. Um, but again, it's a way of, of expressing community and that we really want the biggest message I want to take home is that we don't want kids and families to grieve alone. Mm -hmm. That there are other people that are going through what you're going through, and we want to create a safe space for them. Yeah, I, I have, I mean, it truly is a remarkable place that yeah. you have um, stepped into the, yeah, the, the leadership position lucky. for yeah. here, because really as you describe it in quite well, mm -hmm. um, it's, I think it would strike many viewers as, um, as a great place mm -hmm to bring their children, their mm -hmm. young children, mm -hmm. regardless of what the kind of the, the yeah. looming subject right, matter right. was. In, yes. in other words, take death out of it and mm -hmm. that still looks like right. a lovely right. way to spend an evening. Right. It is, yeah. Um, which really caters to people's different, you know, kids, different developmental right. age, right. ages and kind of wraps everything in, uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a lovely way mm -hmm. that allows all that expressiveness to come out mm -hmm. and then for the families to come together, like you said, yeah. at the end. So everybody is getting, uh, you know, something very individual mm -hmm. right. and then also something collective right. um, out of the out of the process. And yeah. again, that sounds lovely. And to think of that with death right. as the as the the ever present. Right. Um, and, and acknowledged in right. the way that you are talking right. about. Right. That is why I, I think remarkable yeah. is not too strong a term okay. because it's a normalizing Correct. of something that yeah. on the whole, we 
uh, especially, I must say, in our culture yeah. in North America, we yeah. do our best to distance ourselves Correct. from that. You know, I, I've, I've noted uh, in the past how all of our cemeteries are, you know, so many mm. of them are very well groomed and mm -hmm. quite sterile mm -hmm. in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. And there's just this sense that, yeah. you know, that's just a, you know, we that's don't have it. to think about that too much because right. it's just a pretty place over there and let's, you know, concentrate on this. These families yeah. don't have that luxury. They don't. Um, and you've and, created a space yeah. where they can, they can work have that, that out right. in a normal kind of way. And I think language is so important. I think that we get very concerned about shielding kids. And when you don't share certain information with kids, it makes everything so much scarier. Um, so one of the things that we really encourage people to do is to think about their language. So you know, the idea of, oh, someone lost their father or she lost her baby. That can be really confusing for a four or five year old. Well, if they lost them, go find them. Mm -hmm. um, so to, to be really concrete, kids are very concrete thinkers. So it has to be someone died, they're dead, their body stopped working. Um, and to be really clear about what happens. Um, you know, each family is different and we, we don't, there's not a right way or wrong way to grieve. Um, but we definitely encourage more honesty and transparency with kids. And, and that actually ends up, they end up doing better when they're told the truth. Which is, again, a great thing to yeah. share with yeah. our audience because I have, I have to imagine that there are people out there who when you said, mm -hmm. no, that person died, yes. you're telling this four-year-old or yeah. this six-year-old you're going to use that word yeah. or that terminology. Right. Um, like, I can see, yeah, yeah just imagine people <laughs> right. going, oh, no way. Right. Um, and, but what you're, what you're saying right. and what you're proving right. is, in fact, that is the, the better way in general and right. given that each family is different, et cetera, right. but that that, that that really does need to be um, adopted yes. um, as often as possible Absolutely. as the way that, that, that this stuff gets talked yeah. about. Um, the, the kind of night that you were just mentioning mm -hmm. and the families that come in mm -hmm. and, and then um, disperse in the way that they do and come back together again. Mm -hmm. um, is that happening every night? Yeah, um, almost. <laughs> so we have groups at the house Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday afternoons. Okay. Um, on Wednesday evenings, we typically have one or some more of our psychoeducational didactic groups. So we have an eight-week group for um, parenting while grieving which is really helpful for parents who, at this point, which just was spousal loss, but how to think about your parenting and set limits um, when you're grieving yourself and how to support your child, but also to support yourself. Um, so that usually is Wednesday evenings. And then we also have a teen-only support group, because um, surprisingly, you know this, teens don't always want to be with their parents, <laughs> um, so that the whole family night might not work for some folks. Um, so just having teens be able to come, we run that group in the spring on Wednesdays. Um, we also do once a month a family night. So, you know, death affects all members of the family. We're, we're very specific in terms of who we can serve. Mm -hmm. um, but our family nights once a month are this really unique opportunity where you can bring in grandparents and cousins and aunts. We had one family that came with 11 member entourage. Mm -hmm. um, they were all affected by the death mm -hmm. and they all came together and that's when families sit together and we'll, they'll do a specific expressive arts project and then share it with the other families. Um, so we try to, try to figure out different ways. We also do a lot of, um, with our teens only, we also do once a month social groups. Those happen on Saturdays. Um, so this week, I think they're going to Bodeborg in mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Medford. In, yeah, in um, Malden, I think, yeah. Yeah, Malden. And then um, we've done a jewelry workshop where they actually were able to work with metals and create things in, in memory of the person who died. Well, doing a ropes course, they go to the hockey games. Like wow. it's really, and for teens, it's different. So like a, a four-year-old might want to sit down or an eight-year-old and say, and talk, um, and are you know much more concrete. A teen doesn't, maybe a support group model doesn't work for them. But if they know they're going to go rock climbing with right. a group of 10 Do kids something. or 15 kids that also lost a parent or a sibling, even if they don't talk about the death, it's a way to know, like, oh, okay, there's other people. They're really cool. This is super fun, and I get this time with other people like me. Yeah, and I really, I, I, I think I just want to highlight the mm. value of doing this, just bringing these people together Absolutely. to do things together, because yeah. I would imagine that 
well-meaning friends and mm -hmm. relatives, et cetera, are just tiptoeing around right. and not able, so that the kids themselves who are suffering are not necessarily able to relax because they right. can tell that their friends are not, are getting weirded don't out understand, yeah. aren't treating yeah. them the same, et cetera. So here, mm -hmm. just having true peers right. in terms of people going through the same things must make it easier for them Absolutely. just to be more themselves right. and, and, and have that experience that they had before they right. lost somebody. And I, I think with death and with grieving, it isn't a linear process. There is no getting over it. Um, but grief is a way, it becomes incorporated to who you are. So there can be moments of huge joy and happiness and moments of sadness. Um, and that just goes throughout life. Um, so what we, you know, we don't turn people away. Even if it was a death that happened a long time ago, you never know when it's going to affect someone. So it, we always want to be able to bring that community together. Yeah, you just mentioned that you don't turn people away. And yeah. that, that reminds me of my next question, yeah. which is um, you've described programs and yep. activities yep. and spaces, et cetera, that mm -hmm. you provide for people. How is it that people access that? Is, mm -hmm. is, does everybody see the schedule of what is there uh, mm -hmm. available through the course of a week on mm -hmm. given weeknights, et cetera, and yeah. then just they can come if they yeah. want and yeah. not if they don't. Yeah. Um, do they, you know, what What if there are too many people? Like, yeah. do you ever yeah, run yeah, into yeah. that yeah. kind of it's, situation? Um, you know, I, in terms of not turning people away, I, I, I guess I want to clarify that, that we really do um, an intake process, a pretty a comprehensive intake to make sure the family is a good fit for us. Okay. Um, and we also want to protect the privacy of people who not everyone wants to talk about the fact that they came there. So um, we don't have like a drop-in group. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that all of our services are free. We never charge a family member ever for anything that we do, including the work with the teens. Everything is free of charge. So how do you um, get funded then? Um, we have a, a wonderful fundraising philanthropy director, Kim Kerr, who is a great member of the Arlington community. Um, we, you know, we're, uh, count on the, the charity of strangers okay. or the kindness of strangers. What's mm -hmm, the, uh, mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a hundred percent comes from individuals and wow. foundations and grants. Um, we, Sean, uh, Garbley, which is our wonderful state rep has put in a small, um, item into the state budget. So we get a little bit of state funding and a little earmark. Um, but everything else is, is fundraised. Wow. That's yeah. It, and for, yeah. for, for very few better causes, I yes, have to say. Yeah. So that, and I, so you know, thank I goodness think, that people yeah. are digging into their pockets for that. Yeah. That's great. And I think you know, people come towards us either as families or as supporters and donors for very personal reasons, as you can imagine. Um, you know, we have incredibly generous donors who have also been touched by a death loss, either as a child or as an adult. And I dare say and I dare hope that perhaps somebody watching um, so. is going to yeah. be moved in the same way yeah. uh, here because, uh, you know, I, th I think it's fairly clear from the conversation we've already had mm. um, that, that this, is a, this is a place well worth investing yes. in so. uh, the future yeah. of. And we'll talk about that future okay. in just a minute. Uh, we're going to take a short break and then we will be back to discuss the Liz's plans for the future of the children's room and also find out a little bit more about Liz herself. Join us uh, in uh, after this break. Thanks. Can you help me with this? My new dad teaches me all kinds of stuff. Hmm. Sure. He helps me with homework. That would be 3.6795. Thanks. Yep. He helps me with my decision making. I wouldn't use this one. Ever. And he's even teaching me how to drive. And that's why cars have bumpers. I'm learning so much. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. So who's going to do what? I'll pack the dead batteries. Great. I'll only put what I don't need into a duffel bag. Perfect. That's totally unhelpful. No problem. Meanwhile, I will try to comfort everyone by speaking in a calm voice. And who is going to handle supplies? I can forget to do a list for us. Thanks, pal. We couldn't be any less prepared. I'm proud of you guys. Talk to your kids about who to call, where to meet, what to pack. Visit ready.gov slash kids for tips and information. I wish I was in school. If only I had a math test today. I'll stay up 
to class. I'll clean the chalkboard. I wish I was in school. School ends, but free lunches for your kids don't have to. Find your local food bank at feedingamerica.org slash summer meals for help. Welcome back uh, to the second part of our interview with Liz Cohen, the executive director of the Children's Room. Um, I'm curious about a couple of things related to families coming into sure. um, the, the Children's Room. Um, how is it, like if a family finds out about mm -hmm. the Children's Room, yeah. but they're not sure whether it's right for them, mm -hmm. how do they, you know, get more information? Sure. Um, and then on the other end, mm -hmm. um, obviously you deal with a particular population, and but mm -hmm. grief doesn't have any particular age limits right. to it, and so uh, kids may need services beyond the time that they mm -hmm. can be at sure. at, uh, at the children's room yeah. or beyond what children's room can offer. Right. So. Right. Uh, I understand two different parts of this yep. question, but yep. what happens when a family comes onto sure. your radar or yeah. you come onto theirs? And then what happens on the other side if you need, do you have a, a, a referral, like a fertile referral mm -hmm. system yeah. going as well? We have um, a very robust informational referral program. So when folks call into the children's room, they'll get a call back from one of our clinical staff. Um, on average, those calls last about a half hour, and then we'll assess if folks are appropriate to come towards us and join one of our groups or if we refer them out to the community and sometimes they're not mutually exclusive. Some kids will need more or want more individual therapy. Um, we have a really great network of folks that we respect that we will refer folks to. Um, we get calls from different people around the country often because we're one of the most well-known and, and actually best grief and bereavement programs for kids in the country. So we'll get calls to like, what do I do in New Jersey or what do I do in Florida? Mm -hmm. um, so we refer people out that way. Um, we also, you know, one of the things that I'm hoping to build is our marketing work and having people be able to find us. So most of our referral sources are like pediatricians, schools, um, we're trying to get more work with religious organizations. Um, sometimes just word of mouth, um, mm -hmm. but we're trying to. For, one of the things, one of my goals is to build that marketing piece. So hopefully, this conversation would be part of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then, what about when the? Because it was my fault for asking oh, sorry, such the a two, two part questions. question. Yeah, so if it's not the right, you know, I think. How yeah, do people? Yeah. How, well, even ha ha what happens. How do people find out more about right. the children's room before they make any kind of commitment? Because sure. it's a it's a program that they would be right, entering, right. right? And we accept new families just in the fall and then in in February. So okay. we're purposeful about our groups, and you know, like everything we do, it's very intentional and purposeful. Mm -hmm. Um, so if folks are able to find us on the website, I think our website, childrensroom.org, is a great place to start. Um, we're affiliated with NAGC, which is the Nas National Alliance for Grieving Children. We have folks that will find us through that. Um, but if we are not the right fit for someone for whatever reason, um, we'll definitely refer out. Um, you asked kind of like what happens when people graduate, right? So mm -hmm. most people stay, most families stay with the fam with the children's room probably like an average at least two years, sometimes more. We have families that are with us for five years. We have teens that came in for the peer support group when they were younger and now are part of our teen group. Um, we do a lot of work with young alumni and actually bring them in once a year to do a resiliency panel with our teens to talk about what does life look like after you graduate from mm -hmm. high school. Um, but I, I, I think that need of young adults who are grieving, there that is a huge gap. Um, I personally am not aware of a lot of programs out there yeah. for folks. So there will be a there. There needs to be a young adult room at some point. Uh, that would be amazing. To come yeah, in the future. Absolutely. Um, are there? A, do you offer like tours of mm -hmm. the place or something yes. like that for families who are considering? Yep. You know, doing this. Well, we offer um, an intake, and we'll have like a professional one of our clinical staff come and do an intake for families that might be coming towards us to talk about the space and give us give a tour. Um, but one of the things that we love to do is to open our home to people in the community. Um, we're always trying to build our group of ambassadors, people like you who have some kind of connection or care about the work that we're doing and want to spread the word, because that's 
honestly the biggest way that we get referrals is word of mouth. Um, so we often hold tours of our houses uh, on nights when our house when we on nights when we don't have a group, mm -hmm. which is very rare. <laughs> um, or we're also encouraging daytime groups. So we'll come if people want to bring a group of around ten people. It's an hour tour. We're very you know, in and out, one hour, we'll walk through the entire house, talk more about our work, share stories about some of the families that have come towards us, we're able to look at the artwork. Um, so I really, I hope people reach out to the children's room if they're interested in a tour. Yeah, that's a fabulous yeah. thing to know that, that, you know, simply as a concerned member of the community, yeah. you can see what, you know, mm -hmm. some of what the magic yeah. that is happening inside of that building looks like. Yeah. Uh, that's great. Great. So lots and lots of stuff going on inside the mm -hmm. children's room, obviously, right. and, uh, and a, a magical place, as yeah. we've referred to before. Um, do you ever have to or choose to mm -hmm. move out into the community Absolutely. with programs, uh, I mm -hmm. don't know, counseling, advice, uh, yeah. activities? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I'm really proud of is that we're, we realize that not every family can come to Arlington, um, and that there's a lot of families who are dealing with grief um, in different communities and different setups. So one of the things that we've been really trying to build the last few years is our work in the community. So one of our strongest partnerships is with the Lewis D. Brown Peace Institute in, in Dorchester, which was started from a mom whose son was killed in the crossfire of um, gun violence in his community. Um, and so we do a lot of work out there, kind of working with their therapeutic space, uh, helping them. We hold groups at Boys and Girls Club. We currently have a group at in Chelsea and Charlestown. We've done work, obviously, at the Arlington Boys and Girls Club. We also do school groups. So there's, again, some teenagers who don't want to um, be around their parents all the time. Um, so we hold an ongoing group at Audison Middle School. We hold an ongoing group at Lexington High School. Um, we've done groups at Needham High School. So really it's around, we're, we started a new group at the Pos Prospect Hill Academy High School mm -hmm. in Somerville. So it's really around building those collaborations. They're very time intensive. You know, we really, again, are intentional and thoughtful about what we're doing. So we always have staff from a school setting in the room with our staff. So if an issue comes up that will you know, obviously rise up but between the times that we're there, we want to have clinical staff from the site there as well. Um, but it's a really unique way for us to build on our model and to be able to serve kids. Um, and doing it within a school is also really unique. Sometimes it's just certain grades, sometimes it's all grades together. Um, and it's, it's a really fabulous way for us to reach out to people who can't come to the house. Yeah, and obviously you are bound by certain parameters in terms sure. of logistics, how far you can get, et cetera. Right. But it's great to know that, that you're being able to Export the the knowledge and experience and mm -hmm. and um, in in um, it, yeah the knowledge and experience really to a broader section of the mm -hmm. community yeah. it's, you know without being constricted just yeah. simply just to those who can get here. I am sure that you referred before to the fact that you are also have a national reputation. Mm -hmm. I am sure that you know, folks in many other states would mm -hmm. love for you to be able to visit them as well. Yeah. Maybe someday in the future well, maybe, uh, that yeah. will be part of things, who yeah. knows. But for now it is, it is really heartening to know that yeah. you're able to extend yourselves around mm -hmm. the Boston area yeah. um, for, and provide direct um, kind of service and help Thank to you. others. Yeah, I'm really proud of that work. That's great. On Talk of the Town, we always want also to mm -hmm. get to know, we, we're introducing you to the Arlington community yeah. uh, and mm -hmm. vice versa, right. um, but we definitely want to get a, a, a sense of how did you get to yeah. this place? Sure. What has your own journey been yeah. um, to the helm of the children's mm -hmm. room? So uh, just tell us a little bit about sure. your, your own background in this space sure. um, and um, and. Do you have a connection to Arlington already, yeah. or is this the first one? You know, so I've been really lucky in my career to be able to work with a variety of different organizations and nonprofits. Um, my real focus is public health, and I have a master's in public health from BU. And the idea of looking at a community issue and a problem and figuring out how to develop a program to meet the needs of that community has always been my primary focus. 
Um, I've worked in crisis, I've worked uh, crisis work, I've worked in the healthcare field. Um, most recently I was executive director of Families First, which is a parenting program, was in Cambridge, now in Watertown. Um, so I come with experience as an executive director. Uh, I haven't worked in grief or bereavement work before, but it, it seems like a natural flow, especially if you're thinking about um, people at their most vulnerable and the gift of seeing people grow and build through what we view as a traumatic experience and mm -hmm. the resiliency of people. I mean, I'm inspired every day by my work, which is, I've been very, very lucky. Um, so I do have a connection to Arlington. I'm actually a Arlington resident. I've been for 10 years, <laughs> which makes me brand new. Um, <laughs> I live in the Heights. My daughter, I have an eight and a half year old daughter who goes to Dallin. Um, and I'm really excited. I feel like this is a, a secondary benefit of my work at the Children's Room is I feel like I, I'm gonna be an active member of the community. And that's something I'm, I relish, I'm excited about. Probably means I need to wear wake up, makeup to stop and shop, which <laughs> I'm not as excited about. Um, but it, you know, it's exciting to feel like you're giving back to your community. And I think a lot of my peers, you know, kind of these young professionals who have come into Arlington all want to, to be an active part of the community. And I'm, I'm very proud to, to be part of that group. Yeah, and I have to say, 10 years is a good, solid right, stake. Yeah. You're, you're, you are, <laughs> I, I nominate you as a real Arlington. All right, they, I met someone the other day and I said, how long has your family been in Arlington? And he said, 120 years. Yeah. And I said, all right, time new. I guess, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, it depends yeah. on the scale, yes. obviously, yeah. but I, yeah. what I suspect is that there are a lot of people who have moved to Arlington mm -hmm. since you did. Yes, So yes. there, there yes. you go. Um, so let's talk ab about the children's room yeah going out from here. Sure. You are about two months into your tenure, yeah. I think, at, yeah. the, at yeah. the moment, and I'm sure you are planning to be around for a while. Very long we time. certainly hope yes. so. Yeah. So what, what um, yeah. yeah, talk to us about what your vision is for where I'm, things are going. I mean, the Children's Room is at this really interesting juncture um, of, you know, a real attention and a more of a conversation around death, I think, in this country, and we're hopefully moving towards um, more of a conversation. I think things, there are a lot of, unfortunately, like opportunistic things that we can think about. So, um, you know, for example, the opioid crisis. It's unfortunately touched Massachusetts. It's touching Arlington. Um, and I don't know what services are available for families who have lost a family member or a family member died because of substance abuse. So that's like kind of an interesting angle. Mm -hmm. um, but we're a very strong organization. We're financially strong. We have amazing, amazing, generous, committed supporters. Um, but for me, you know, because I'm a public health person, I'm a, I'm a data person. I really want to understand what I'm dealing with. So one of the hardest questions that I'm trying, there's kind of two hard questions that I'm trying to answer. Um, and I hope this is kind of my focus for the next couple months. The first one is how many people are we, could we be serving? So there's a question of we serve about 500 people, 150 families in the house, and the rest kind of through a variety of activities that we talked about. Um, how many kids right now are out there who've experienced the death of a sibling or a parent and are the ages between three and a half and 18 in those 80, 100 communities that are on the eastern seaboard of Massachusetts, right? So that's a really interesting question that we don't have the answer to. The national statistic is one in 18 so that we look at one in 18 children under the age of 18 have experienced the death of a parent or a sibling. So if you look at that's like one per a classroom, two on a school bus. Wow. So that's still, those are still big numbers. Yeah, and a um, heck of a lot a, more than 500. In, exactly, in right? So that there's about. a lot of people that, you know, for whatever reason we're not reaching, they're not coming towards us, whatever. So it, it, it's, for me, it's like, how many people could we be serving is the, my big first question. And we haven't really had the answer to that. And then the overlay of, you know, what programs are available. We're not the only grieving center in the state, I would argue we're the best. <laughs> um, but, you know, there are other programs. So where, you know, looking at the numbers, but then also where, where could they access services? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then my second question, which I'm hoping to grapple with is, what, what is the outcome that we're trying to measure, right? I, I think we're, nonprofits on a whole are moving away from where we were in the 80s and 90s when money was a very, philanthropy was very different, where 
um, organizations were started and people were able to get funding for things that just felt good, that were logical. You know, a kid experiences a parent who dies, you give them services, duh, like we should pay for that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the philanthropy community, especially the funding community, has gotten more sophisticated. And there's a real movement towards mergers and larger organizations and taking almost a venture capital view of looking at philanthropy. Mm -hmm. And an important piece of that is to think about outcome measurements. So for every dollar that you give the children's room, what are you getting in return? So if I give you a dollar, if I give you $1,000, and $1,000 covers one kid through one group, what, what do we hope to see as an outcome for that child? Um, and, and the hard thing um, is that there, one, aren't national kind of measurement tools around grief, but two, a lot of what a lot of what our work leads to is things not happening, right? So when you have a really good intervention point, kids, you know this as a, as a former teacher, kids aren't dropping out of school, they're not using drugs, they're not getting pregnant. You know, the millions of things that we don't want to have happen don't happen because we're able to meet their initial emotional needs, we're able to create a sense of community, reduce isolation, incorporate the person who died into their life. So how do you measure what doesn't happen? And what are the tools that we can use to try to measure? And I can talk to someone and say, you know, when you find the children's room and a child comes here, this is what we're seeing as far as outcomes. So that's kind of my second struggle question. Yeah, that's a tough one because yeah. uh, it, it certainly echoes uh, my one of my producer's mm -hmm. favorite questions, mm -hmm. which is how do you measure success? And right. that's right. what you're talking right. about exactly. there. And yeah. But like you said, success in this case is it, it comes in the form of a negative in some ways, exactly. all the things that right. you could pre prevent or preempt from happening. Right. Um, right. And that's that's awful hard to measure. Right. And how do we know that ours is the best program? How do we know that our intervention works? How long should families be in our program? Like all those questions that we don't have the answer to, that, that's really interesting to me. Um, so one, you know, kind of the first question was really around gaps and who are we not serving? And two, as we think about having a conversation about, you know, how do you measure success? Those are the two things that are gonna tee us up to be able to look at replication and building and growing. Yeah, so first steps first, obviously. Yeah, right. Um, but if 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 you don't mind, let's let's do a little conjecture here yeah. and assume that you find out, as you suspect, that mm -hmm. the number of people you could be serving far right. exceeds the number of people yes, that, that you are assumption. serving. Yep. Um, and secondly, that there is some way of measuring success, and mm -hmm. that it turns out that your program is right. excellent in those terms. Right. Um, if those two things pertain, right. um, how what what would the next steps right. be towards you know getting to more people mm -hmm. um, and exporting a, a, a clearly mm -hmm. success or a demonstrably successful yeah. model? I mean, one is thinking about our website and trying to think about how do we get it into the twenty first century? How do we incorporate? you know, for people who can't get to the house, resources. So do we embed videos? Do we, how do we create that sense of community? You may be looking at our online presence. That's one question. The other is where are there communities where there's nothing, right? So if there is an area down by Brockton or an area up by Lowell, and again, this is not written in stone, I'm just mm -hmm. using as examples. Maybe there's a lot of people there and there's nothing around them. Then we look at that community, we look at the community connections that we can make, and we think about, do we open another house? Do we expand and replicate? I think if we're gonna hold ourselves as a model, we have to prove that we know how to replicate ourselves well first. And that, we haven't tested that yet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I had to do, you know, a five year, you know, if I had a million, well, probably more than a million dollars, mm -hmm. um, you know, it really would be to test that theory of what would it look like to go into a new community and build a house? Mm -hmm. um, you know, can we expand our space here in Arlington? Um, you know, the house is really special. It's a historic house. So, um, you know, I think there's, there's places to move mm -hmm. um, but uh, and grow. Um, but you know, are we using the house to its fullest potential? Um, how much do we do work in the community and what do those relationships with schools look like? Um, I'm also interested in kind of this medical model, like how many pediatricians are dealing with questions around death and dying? Um, 
are we reaching all those folks? Are those a good sense of referral or, or do we do more of a training the trainer? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's a really, it's an interesting time where it's, you know, for me, it's really data collection and understanding what we're dealing with and then thinking about how do we replicate and expand. Great. I mean, these are clearly early days for your Very own early, tenure. Yeah. And yeah. also, um, you know, as you've mentioned, the children's room is in good shape. Yeah. Um, yeah. So consolidating on all of that and getting some good information and right. then taking those next steps makes yeah. a lot of sense. Right. And we will hope that, uh, I don't know, six months, a year, Mm -hmm. a year and a half from now, we can revisit uh, with you again and get a sense of of where things are moving at that point. I'm sure they will be. Yeah, I would love that. Best of luck. Thank you Um, so much. It's clearly important work and you're clearly well suited for it. So let's let's hope things go well. Excellent. Thank you. Um, For Liz Cohen, the newish executive (laughs) director of the Children's Room here in Arlington, I'm James Milan. This is Talk of the Town. Thanks for joining us. Oh, 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 oh,